So, filling form, risk assessment, risk management, do you want to share how did you get into insurance before we jumped into what you were actually doing? Uh, I'm like kind of engineer by trade. So I, I did a, a master's of mechanical engineering. I always thought my degree in life would be down engineering. So so every single summer I used to go out and get work experience. So uh, I uh, worked on the buses with a, a company called Aviva, where I was literally putting on and off wheels and fixing buses. I spent a summer with a company called uh, um, uh, Costain, uh, where we were building uh, the Beckton Shed extension on the DLR line. Uh, so that was kind of like a very junior project management role, helping things uh, move along. Um, I, I did uh, work for a company called uh, Costain Klesha, um, and they so they are um, the like smart motorway specialists in the, in the UK. So we were doing risk analysis uh, for smart motorways and building projects and and putting in bids for local governments. And this is all like my early days, and this is how I used to spend my summer um, uh, while I was at university doing engineering. <laughs> the The answer to to that was uh, I basically learned what I didn't want to do. So I actually kind of did a bit of research and uh, I kind of I spoke to quite a lot of people like financial services. Um, I was like, who's happy? That, that was my fundamental question that I was asking. Uh, and, and wait, wait, I think wait. In insurance... you, want to, you want to tell me that the happy people are insurance people? If you that's speak a... to a broker that's uh -huh. 30 years old, they'll probably okay. be generally happy with their life. 40 year olds okay. they're still happy with their life and 50 year olds they're probably and still just living one of their best lives possible if they're still in the industry um so yeah that that, that was like kind of my fundamental reason so of, of joining the insurance industry um kind of okay. pitched up at aon and basically say hey can I have a job so kind of doing some work experience and then got in there and networked my way around aon to uh to to kind of kind of get in the strategy side of things with uh with aeon's like internal strategy consultants where we were consulting the the large insurers insurers of the world insurers and reinsurers and from aeon how did you get to lloyd's so i spent a short stint outside of the insurance industry so i kind of within a strategy role you um uh, consulting you kind of worked on very short projects um uh, and I kind of wanted to get a kind of internal strategy role. Internal strategy in insurance is relatively few and far between. Uh, it's, it's not an, an overly typical role. It's not necessarily required in all organizations. Um, so I moved to Fitch Ratings initially, so outside of the insurance industry, uh, which was great. So working in their internal strategy team, did some amazing things, really great company, amazing business. Um, but fundamentally, uh, I kind of just actually quite liked insurance it was good fun so I wanted to move back um, so I spent a bit of time with Zigo so Zigo the motor insurance startup um, where I was helping them out on their international strategy and helping them do license applications for setting up new insurers um, amazing company again also amazing people great team a great working environment as well um, but I, I think that well, they're fundamentally, as I said earlier, the, the opportunities are few and far between and, and one opened up at Lloyd's, uh, which is a relatively small team. And I don't really think there's a bigger place, an, another place that you can have as much of an impact as you can at Lloyd's, especially with the scale and the size of the marketplace uh, that, that it is and, 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 and just making the change in that org organization that's been around for so long um, is, is, is a quite attractive pool. So what is strategy in insurance and what do you do at Lloyd's? So I'm a strategy manager uh, at Lloyd's. So um, like the high level pitch that we kind of go for is our goal is to deliver the, the long term profitable growth uh, of the Lloyd's market and kind of keep Lloyd's at the forefront of global insurance and reinsurance. So that's that's the pitch line of, of what we're trying to achieve within our kind of like strategy world. Um, but in actuality, what, what, what is that? So 
So that is doing the research, it's identifying the trends, it's it's finding out the reason why things are happening, why they're they're happening as they are, and then also what can we do about it and how can we go about improving uh, the, the London market. So and the nice thing is this is an internal strategy role. So compared to my previous one, which was a strategy consulting, um, this isn't just focusing on the why in terms of making the strategic recommendation. This is mm -hmm. making the strategic rec recommendation, but then also helping implement those uh, recommendations and actually kind of delivering on it, which again is, 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 a, is, is really fun. Nope. For the audience, mainly for the American audience that listens, and actually for everyone who is not really familiar with Lloyd's, let's take a few steps back, if you don't mind, and of course. tell us more about Lloyd's, how it started, what's the history, because it's been around for like 300 years, and then we can roll yeah. and, you know, talk about what's the new Lloyd's, and if we can touch, I, I'm not sure how much you can talk about what's the future of Lloyd's, and we... And we'll continue from there. So let's start with the history. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'll, I'll start with the history and then I'm sure we'll be able to talk about more about kind of where we're going and, and what we're kind of doing and, and how we're doing it as well. Um, history of Lloyd's, uh, I've got a couple key dates and I've needed to write them down because I would not be able to remember them <laughs> off, off the top of my head. So uh, <laughs> uh, 1688, so, so Lloyd's started as a coffee shop. So in London, there were uh, lots of maritime vessels, and this is when the global trade was absolutely booming. So, so people who are owning ships and had lots of money were deploying their capital at that time to uh, transport uh, coffee from uh, Asia, spices from Asia, like trade all across the world, and they were bringing it back to, to London and other European hubs. There was a significant risk in doing this, right? So you, a, a, mm -hmm. a, a rich person, a, a person was putting their money and capital in to, to fund this voyage and not necessarily knowing if they're going to get any return on their investment because these voyages were, were so long, so slow. So what were, what's happening is they were meeting up in this coffee shop and then rather than one person funding it, multiple people were getting together to to fund these uh these ships and voyages across across the ocean um so probably the next kind of big uh point in in lloyd's history is uh so as this has been happening for for a good number of years so so 1688 it started and and this was called the lloyd's list uh around 1750 this is when uh, that model of maybe an informal agreement started to become formalized as things have happened over so many years. So, so they've had 70 years of doing this informal agreement, which has then evolved and, and become a lot more formalized. Um, so this is basically where they, the subscription market developed. So what that is, and just kind of explain this kind of syndication kind of element of it is it's one risk with multiple people taking a portion of that risk and splitting that across multiple uh, mul multiple uh, uh, people with capital who wanted to allocate it to to that maritime vessel the next kind of like real kind of key and and an an important point in lloyd's history is uh uh lloyd's has been doing this for now a hundred a, a quite a while so uh probably 200 years at this point so 1870s um 1871 Lloyd's is established by law by act of parliament um, um, which bas basically lays out the the kind of the the operations of Lloyd's how it needs to act and fundamentally creates the first insurance marketplace uh, in the world so in Lloyd's is as we as you said earlier is it's not a company it's a marketplace it's where market participants operate to to transfer risk and, uh, and and buy insurance and hopefully get a return on on their investment at the end um the next kind of like important date is previously at this point most of the insurance policies that have been around have been uh, they've all been mostly marine um this is like where lloyd's kind of starts to innovate a lot more so we issue like the first motor policy which at that point because most of the things have been marine, it was a marine vessel on land, which was the classification of uh, of that first policy, which is always quite fun. Um, 
and then I think it, it happened at a relatively similar time. So, so bear in mind, insurance as a concept is, is starting to develop quite significantly at this point. Um, in 1906, uh, the San Francisco earthquakes, which wiped out quite a lot of San Francisco, um, this is where Lloyd's probably differentiated itself from other insurance players uh, a lot in the market. And basically, so there was a really terrible earthquake, lots of insurance losses and lots of insurance claims. Lloyd's immediately said, we are paying all of our claims related to this event. Whereas lots of other insurers maybe dilly dallied around, either didn't pay their claims because it wasn't covered strictly in the wording, but, but Lloyd's immediately just said, we're paying all the claims and, and basically issued the payment across all. I think the number at the end of that event is in totality, um, I think only around like circa 70% of the, the the claims that were issue, issued like got paid. Um, so really kind of cemented Lloyd's reputation, especially in the US market for just paying all valid claims where, where there were other local US insurers at that time uh, were potentially not paying out the, those claims. Uh, the next one is maybe not, not the most positive point in terms of this is an, uh, kind of, uh, so in, in 1987, like in, important to note, so previously at this point, and, and I think we'll talk about it a bit further uh, on, is the fact that Lloyd's has been funded by just certain individuals who have a lot of wealth, which we classify as members at Lloyd's. Um, and so these members were, were funding Lloyd's and funding all the capital that was going and being placed on insurance risks. Um, in 18, uh, 1987, uh, we started to get asbestosis uh, claims coming through. Uh, we also had significant cat events over a good number of years as well, uh, which, which basically caused a significant number of losses uh, across the whole insurance industry, but ones that Lloyd's was specific, uh, is especially uh, susceptible to. Um, so I think, I, think, I think the number is around 8 billion of losses. Uh, and bear in mind that this is in 1987. So 8 billion is a very large number. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, so a lot of the members basically had to pay those claims. Uh, but the reason why it's important to note is because this kind of notes a good changing in the times in terms of we Lloyd's started to get corporate capital involved in Lloyd's rather than individual member capital so around i think it's 1994 the first kind of corporate capital we entered lloyd's and as as lloyd's is today most of it is corporate capital there are a few members still around a few names uh is for the individual member as they're called um but they're so still around today but the majority of lloyd's is is funded by corporate capital and then kind of maybe on the more most recent side of things uh, in terms of again on the kind of capital side of things we've we've basically been expanding that out quite significantly so building on Lloyd's USP so I think in 2021 uh, Lloyd's launches something called London Bridge uh, and that's a way for third party capital to enter to Lloyd's and, and get access to, to risk in a uh, relatively uncorrelated way compared to just investing in a in a company as they would normally do. But no, so that's like the short kind of history of Lloyd's uh, with some kind of my personal, from a strategic point of view, uh, kind of uh, bigger, bigger selling points and, and big kind of moments in history. Okay, let me let me try to, uh, I don't know, uh, limit, limit yeah. the answer with my questions because it's like, oh, what's the history? And I'm sure that there is so much to cover even more because it's only, so, you know, yeah. the history and the different milestones that shaped Lloyd's today and, um, you know, in the underwriting hall, you have, a, oh, what's the name of the ship that uh, you have the bell from? Lutein starts bell. with an F. Okay, not with an F, with an L. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that sunk in, f uh, what, what it was uh, with gold that's, that's, uh, going up. I, uh, I don't know when, but I can tell you the st story. So, so Lutein Bell was um, transporting gold uh, across the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. the, the ship sunk. Um, Lloyd's paid out the claim for, for that loss. Uh, and then as with insurance, it's, it, you, you get to the principles of a uh, um, salvage. So, so they, one of the insurance principles is salvage. So after you've paid out a claim that 
the, 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 the insured object, it now becomes the object of the insured. So when they've recovered that vessel and the gold and everything within it, um, that's now the, uh, the, um, the, the property of the insurer and not of the insured at that time because they've paid out the claim. That's a cool story, especially that now it's, you know, in the underwriting hall and you ring it uh, in a disasters or in other occasions. Okay, so this is great, you know, you cover the super important milestones for Lloyds and how it shaped modern art. So what's, how it operates today and if you can talk about what are the plans for the future? Sure. I'll go for the operations today because it is quite, quite different. So um, I'll start with the brokers. So so at Lloyd's, we, we have brokers, as you do with, within the rest of the world. Um, and, and these guys bring the business into Lloyd's, uh, the, the kind of uh, the marketplace. So whenever I like to explain this, and I'm not sure if anybody else does, uh, but I like to explain it as a comparison against a normal insurance company. So within a normal insurance company, that insurance company is responsible for all roles uh, within that company. So that, that insurance company is responsible for the capital. So they, they need to have the capital to, to have the solvency ratio. They, they're responsible for governance, operations, reporting, underwriting, claims, reserving, like the, the whole thing. They, they, they need to do absolutely everything. Um, whereas uh, in Lloyd's, uh, it's, it's slightly different. So there's three key entities within Lloyd's. You have, um, uh, you have members, uh, which we covered slightly previously. Uh, you have managing agents uh, and you have syndicates. So, and their roles and responsibilities vary. So a, a, a member is fundamentally responsible for the capital. So they're there to bring the capital in to Lloyd's and supply it to the managing agents and syndicates to, to write the risks. You then have the managing agents. That, so the managing agents are the legal entity that, that runs the business. So they're responsible for all the governments. They're responsible for all the operas, operations. They're re responsible for, for all the reporting, both to Lloyd's and, and potentially some regulatory reporting as well. And then you have syndicates uh, at, at the end who are responsible for, for the underwriting, the, the claims, the reserving uh, and, and reinsurance. Um, one, one kind of really interesting point that I think a lot of people don't necessarily always know, but it's like kind of my fun fact, um, is a syndicate is not a legal entity. So you can't sue a syndicate. It's, it's impossible. It's, it's an annual venture set up uh, uh, with, with, a, with a group of people for, for a year, which typically renews uh, each year. Um, so not being a legal entity means that they can't issue employment contracts. They, they can't be sued. They, they can't do a lot of things. And it's a really interesting nuance that that's only specific to Lloyd's. Um, that's, that's not specific to anyone else. Like you can still do all the same things, but the actual people responsible is the managing agent who's responsible for the, for the governments and, and operations of that, of the company. So what happens in claims? Who do they sue? So, so the claims, even though, so the syndicate is responsible. So that syndicate is issuing policies. Those policies and claims will be paid. Um, and the syndicate is responsible, uh, but all the operations of that syndicate is run by the managing agent. So, mm -hmm. so the syndicate, whatever number it is, will issue the policy, will pay the claims all related to that syndicate. Um, but all the, all the money will come from the members. So a syndicate can have multiple members participating uh, if it wants. And then all of those members would pay those claims. But the managing agent is in the middle kind of doing all the operations of, of that company. And, and even though, yeah, like the syndicate's doing the work, but all of the employment mm -hmm. contracts is, is done by the managing agent. The, uh, the underwriting sits on a small ramp, then the broker sits on a stool next to them to do their business. What happens in the other floors now, if I remember 14 floors? What, yeah, so what else is there? 
Yeah, so currently today, so we've got the ground floors and then we've got three other floors allocated to, to underwriting at, at the moment. Um, the corporation sits on uh, one of the floors. So that is the corporation that manages the, 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 the marketplace and, and, and manages the, the rules, regulations, oversight of, of the entire marketplace. Um, but then we've also got like lots of other entities within the building. So uh, like we've got the Lloyd's Lab, which is like the innovation hub uh, on, on floor floor. We've also got lots of associations within the building. So we have the, the LMA, so London Market Association within the building of which lots of the participants within the market are members of uh, the, the LMA. Uh, and then we also help just facilitate the kind of other entities across the market. So uh, you've got LIMOS, which is, uh, I don't know the acronym, but like we, we have lots of other market participants within the building uh, you, you using it. And, and it's a real place just to facilitate uh, the market and facilitate insurance business uh, in a central location. So I'll sort of go back and I don't know how much you can touch about the future of Lloyd's. Lloyd's, there is the Lloyd's of London and I had the opportunity to meet uh, with the folks uh, in uh, Belgium. Um, and there is, so Lloyd's Europe, Lloyd's US. How is that changing? How, what is the approach, you know, as you go Lloyd's and change it with the world? Because we've seen the reinsurance bigger and bigger, you know, go, growing big and very active. At the same time, they are inside Lloyd's as well. So there is always some sort of a collaboration. What what are the, oh, I'm going back to the, <laughs> what are the plans for the future? But I don't know. Uh, you can tell me in what you can tell about various partnerships and growing Lloyd's with the different uh, markets or different uh, territories yeah. so so then kind of comes back to the, the actual kind of fundamental role of what lloyd's is right so so lloyd's mm -hmm. lloyd's we need to facilitate the marketplace uh, for the long-term profitable growth of of the lloyd's market but in terms of um risk selection we we we, we do not and would not get involved in those conversations right that is of the syndicate yeah to to make those decisions so if if none of our syndicates within the lloyd's market have appetite for selecting risks in certain locations it's not on us to force them to write risks in those locations it's it's on them to kind of come to their own growth plans and and hopefully they would want growth because who doesn't want growth who doesn't want profitability so um we can all we can do within the, the the Lloyd's market is help facilitate those conversations but then also on, on the kind of the other end of the stick is we're a great advocate for for Lloyd's and and for the business so within the role of the corporation uh, we have we need to one maintain the licenses so we have a huge network of licenses all across the world where underwriters in London can issue local pay uh, local insurance policies uh, all across the world. Uh, we, so I think that it's, it's in around 80 countries we can issue local insurance policies. In in a, I think around 100 more we can issue reinsurance policies. So we have an absolutely ginormous network uh, of 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 insurance policies. And then what we do a lot in each of these countries. So we don't necessarily direct growth, but what we do do is we promote. Lloyds of London as a place for these countries and risks within these territories to come to Lloyds and bring their business to Lloyds because they can be written here. So we, we would advocate for risks to be placed in the Lloyds market. And that's how we go about facilitating and helping hopefully Lloyds grow. But in terms of actual risk selection, we don't get involved with what the syndicates do. In terms of like you, you, you did touch on a a point earlier as well in terms of like the strategy right mm -hmm. and, and it kind of ties into this kind of question as well yeah um and uh, uh, if anything i actually ignored uh, i didn't ignore it I, I just missed that question uh <laughs> when when you were asking uh, around the kind of structure just because it was such a a kind of a, a long uh kind of question but uh we have four kind of big strategic goals at lloyd's right it's 
performance. So, so we need good underwriting performance. We need long-term profitable growth and, and it needs to be sustainable. We've got digitization. So we've got like our blueprint too. So everything that we're doing there to, to kind of automate our data journeys or uh, like uh, make our kind of, uh, yeah, just ev all the work that we're doing on, on blueprint too. Uh, we've got our purpose. So we have, we have the strap line of sharing risks to create a braver world. Um, and, and kind of you could like the Lloyd's lab is a great embodiment of that in terms of the, just enhancing innovation within the Lloyd's market, um, new risk kind of, and new ways of approaching risk and being able to cover new risks, uh, via innovation is like helping us be brave and, and, and kind of sharing risk around. And then the last kind of pillar about kind of what we're doing to to kind of help really kind of grow the market is is on the kind of culture of the market because insurance is a place where uh, you have really really kind of talented underwriters who are judging these risks and trying to know as much as they can about very niche topics so we at Lloyd's want to foster the best culture uh, in the world to attract the best talent in the world uh, to participate within the Lloyd's market and that's kind of like the kind of the addition on uh, to kind of what we're doing to like really kind of hopefully grow the Lloyd's market in the long term. If you don't mind, let's give a little bit of love to to Lloyd's lab. And I need to invite the, the new heads of uh, the lab for their own, uh, their own episode because hey, uh, after the, 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 how can I say that? A, a new leadership there. Um, yeah. What What's the essence of Lloyd's Lab in the bigger scheme, right? Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the first cohort and, you know, it was, they were just trying to understand what it is. I think, who was it? Uh, no, BCG. I think it was BCG back then that was uh, in Lmarks were helping to facilitate and set yep. uh, uh, plans for the future today. I have no idea. Yeah. So, so, so today it's all run in house. So we we run the lab completely within the corporation, which is uh, amazing. It means gives us so much more control over the process. And and if if anything, I, I at least personally, maybe I'd argue uh, uh, our most recent cohort nine was one of the most successful cohorts that we've we, we've ever had. And, and the process is run as smoothly as possible. And and if anything, excited for cohort 10 that's going to be coming up in uh, early 2023. Um, but take it back to your point on, on kind of what is the purpose of the Lloyd's Lab. Um, so the purpose of the Lloyd's Lab is to increase the pace of successful innovation uh, across Lloyd's in the London market. Um, supporting like by like the like technology and 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 like innovative solutions uh and and maybe more specifically in a fast track and fast fail environment so we we're willing to accept uh ideas that potentially would would not like to test new ideas and and also let them fail uh in, in a relatively quick manner so we've had ranging participants to guys with just a really great idea who are just starting their journey to, I think most one of the more recent cohorts, we had Swiss Re participating with some new innovation that they wanted to uh, uh, to test out and they came to the Lloyd's lab to, to test it. So it doesn't matter on, on the scale of it. Uh, we're here just to innovate for the Lloyd's marketplace and, and bring solutions to our market. Well, you know that I'm just setting it up for the next question, which is, okay, I have a, an early stage startup or have a mature startup, which is basically an insurance company at this point, how do I interact with Lloyd's or do I interact only with the Lloyd's lab? Is it only within the cohorts? What happens? Who should they talk with? So for, for early stage startups, like the lab is, is definitely the best place to, to kind of just start that initial conversation. And I think throughout the year no matter if a cohort's going on at the moment or or if we've got applications open for the next cohort um 
always send the lab team a, a message. I think you'll be able to find the the emails and appropriate contact details on our on our website if you just Google like Lloyd's Lab um, and and shoot them an email and and they're they're really responsive and really friendly people and, and they'll get back to you shortly. Um, <clears throat> so they're the best place uh, for for a relatively uh, like a new startup. But if you're a relatively mature business and you're wanting to have a conversation around new entrants, so if you're you've already got an insurance company, you think you've got the scale, and you really want to start using Lloyd's as USP, so kind of it takes it back to the street strategic reasons of why you choose Lloyd's is you get the financial rating. So we have the central fund, so we uh, we've got a shared financial rating, so you've got an, a really good A rating uh, from a number of. Uh, uh, credit rating agencies. You've also got the global license network, uh, global license network. So you can write insurance policies. So if you wanted to start doing international expansion, uh, you can write insurance policies directly in 80 territories, or you've already got the reinsurance arrangements in place. So you can issue reinsurance policies with your potential fronting partners uh, already. Uh, so, so a great place for, for international expansion. And, and for that route, you kind of you, you start to potentially look to our new entrance team. Again, you'll find the the new entrance team on our website. Um, again, they're they're really responsive, really really nice people, uh, and and they're happy to kind of listen to the inquiries. And uh, it's always fun to see all the new syndicates uh, kind of coming through. Um, which again, I'm I'm happy to talk about more because there's, there's there's a couple of different types as well, uh, which is. Uh, so do companies reach out directly or they need to use the different big brokers to reach out? But if you if we are about to talk about types of syndication, hey, by all means, I'm here all day. Well, well actually, no. <laughs> but... So, yeah, yeah no. Um, but but so with, with, that, with that point is like all, all the contact information is on, on the website. So so grab, grab the email addresses uh, and, and reach out. Or if not, like, reach out to the Lloyd's lab team and they'll be able to direct you to the, to the right people or, or, or myself and I'll always be able to help direct to, to the right and, and appropriate people to speak to within the corporation. Uh, in terms of uh, the different types of syndicates, so we've got a normal syndicate uh, and then we most recently developed a, a syndicate in a box. So that is a way for syndicates to t set up a temporary vehicle for three years, test their kind of new ideas. Uh, and really kind of, a, again, we, we kind of did it to help foster innovation within the insurance market. Um, more recently, setting up a, a more official captive syndicate, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting uh, venture. So that's going to be really exciting when we get some captives in, uh, utilizing the Lloyd's uh, Global mm -hmm. Insurance Network, uh, as well as our financial strength rating. So they're kind of meeting all their uh, risk risk uh, appetite matrices that they're set, especially if they're a public company. So normal uh, public companies uh, normally only want to be insured by A-rated insurers. And, and this is a way that uh, they can kind of get that credit rating re credit rating uh, relatively efficiently. Um, you have something called SPAs, uh, which is probably isn't too applicable for, for these kind of new entrants that we may be talking about. But an SPA is an arrangement where you reinsure a portion of a syndicate's risk, and it's just one reinsurance deal that you, you sign. Um, so that's syndicate, syndicate in a box, captive syndicate, uh, an SPA. So they're the kind of four different types of syndicates that we've got at Lloyd's. Very cool and very helpful, especially I didn't know about, and I, I, I would assume, well, I'm sure that there were so many announcements about Syndicate in the Box, and most likely I've seen it and liked it on LinkedIn and said, oh my God, this is amazing. And now I just don't remember of doing it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it happened a good number of years ago, uh, and again, maybe I'll, I'll say well, it's one of the things that we've we've been working on at the moment. And and I know the new entrance team; they are, I think, updating the website at the moment. Uh, and 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 yeah, go on to the website, have a look at all the great things that they've uh, they've done there, and and it's and hopefully laying out in a in a really kind of clear and concise way around all the different types of syndicates and and how to how to apply and what the process looks like. And here is one of the things that I really love love about Lloyd's is the the ability to merge tradition and innovation. And knowing that the future is in front of us, not behind us, but still keeping all the tradition from a, a how you call, oh my god, a Stuarts, not but yeah, 
uh, the different stewards and the different tradition. And uh, I had the opportunity to be in one of the remember remember nest days and see yeah, remembrance the, day. Yeah, I, I I cannot. I know it's just remember. It's quite special, the, isn't it? Yeah, just Amazing. the amount of people in the building, like the 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 affair that's made. It, it's it's really special, and it does make you feel a part of something. Which is, mm-hmm. which I think is so important for, for the the kind of like traditions of Lloyd's and like the fact that we still have uh, all the security guards dressed up in like the 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 kind of the the uniforms outside. So that's that's been a constant for for a very long time, and it's just something that comes with uh, what working there and working within the marketplace, and it's uh, it's quite special. And updating the book and doing it in handwriting yes. and all of these things. And at the same time, always looking to the future and asking, okay, what can we do? What's the next re- next risk? How do we adopt? How do we integrate technology? And, and you just say that, that, you know, COVID sort of kicked things forward while, you know, the urban legend about the binders, which is part of the tradition. And uh, there were a few hazing back in the day on all kinds of things that related just to change that yeah. to iPad, because then you can couple of clicks or taps and swipes all the information is flowing and you don't need to run with that binder because if you lose that binder you need to start from scratch yeah no there, we had a there was a great juxtaposition on on the floor which was amazing uh, most recently so there was a a space ex- exhibition so lloyd's oh. does a lot of uh, insurance of satellites um but it, it's quite funny because that exhibition was held two meters away from the book that you just mentioned there, where they're still writing today in ink uh, and by quill, uh, all of the ship losses. So there was a exhibition of satellite insurance and, and all space insurance uh, two meters away from, from the book that the, uh, the Titanic loss was recorded in and, and, and all ships that all known losses of ships that recorded are, are still there today. Fantastic. James, thank you very, very much for joining me. Uh, your afternoon, evening, my early morning. Well, almost early morning. It's just morning. It was a pleasure talking with you. Perfect. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.